All right, let's get rolling. Uh, welcome to the last panel of the day in this room, uh, on the last day of the show. Um, this, this panel is Comics and Fabulism. And we have, from left to right, we have uh, Rumi Hara. That is Kit Anderson. <laughs> Kit brought a following. <laughs> um, the publisher of an Ignatz winning book, Daryl Seitchik. <laughs> and then, of course, Gabrielle Bell. Uh, so, a little bit uh, kind of conceptually about this panel. Um, everyone on it, when I was putting it together, is someone, um, it's not so much that their comics are like obviously deliberately and immediately surreal or dreamlike, but rather that um, they have the beginnings of naturalism, reality, and then there's this shift, sometimes dramatic, sometimes subtle, and uh, we're kind of gonna be getting into what everybody, um, everybody's ideas and conceptions of the kinds of stories that they do when they do. Um, and I very, I, as I encourage this with all panels, but especially this one, that um, once initial ideas are discussed, everyone should be fielded to jump in with everyone else, because I'm the cross-pollination of ideas for this is, is, is very interesting to me. But we will start with, um, with Rumi, who uh, just recently published a book called The Peanut Butter Sisters and Other American Stories. Um, and this is the titular story. And um, throughout this book, and this is a book, um, especially these, these are stories, it's interesting you say American stories, I wanna kind of ask about that specific title but these are all stories about, um, about women and girls and the kind of paths they walk. And uh, with the title story, I was, I was wondering about uh, the reality these girls are living in. It feels incredibly lived in and incredibly strange um, and alien at the same time. And that's the tone of your book. And uh, I sort of asked to sort of you know, talk about like what goes into telling the story in this particular way. What leads you to want to mix the strange and the familiar? Uh, yeah, so um, the, the book is a short story collection and it's called uh, The Peanut Butter Sisters and Other American Stories mm -hmm. because it all takes place in America in the US and I wanted to highlight that because I am technically not from here. I am from Japan. Um, so, but I did partially grew up in the States and um, uh, it, it, it's a really hard question to answer when someone asks me where you're from. Mm. Um, so through living here for the past 10 years and um, creating these short stories, I feel like I became more American in my own way. So it's also uh, where the stories are set, but also how um, I became American um, a little more. Uh, and they're, they're all stories of fiction. And um, I feel like uh, I, I can do anything <laughs> I want in fiction, but also um, uh, surreal things are part of the everyday life. Um, even if you don't talk about it, you, you feel it. Um, so I feel like comics is a place where you can talk about what you don't usually talk about. Um. And especially at a visual level, I imagine, it's that you know, this is, these girls are like writing hurricanes and doing yeah. all these unusual things, and this is just like, this is their daily reality. 
and it seems like you're saying that like, you know, life is strange and we pretend that it's not. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, there's a strong sense of place in your story, be it, and there, it seems to verge, be, change between urban settings and like the cities themselves have this kind of alive quality and you've got kind of these abstract settings um, where these unusual things are happening. And then you've got these wild, um, natural settings. Uh, does setting determine story or story determining setting? Um, how does that usually work for you? Uh, it depends on the story, but... Um Often, I, I really want to go visit a place. Uh, for example, this is kind of a um, imagined landscape, but um, there's a story that takes place in the Mojave Desert, and I really wanted to go to Joshua Tree. Um, so uh, making it a comic project kind of gives me an excuse to go there and expense it out. And <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> so it's, it, it's usually that I'm thinking about the business finances a little bit, but um, also because, and then I go there and I'm really inspired. Um, like when I visited Joshua Tree, it started raining and I didn't know that it rains in the desert before, before this, so um, I wanted to, um, I wanted the flash flood to be part of the story, so there's a scene of the flash flood in the book. So, yeah. Um, all right, well, we will return back to this later. Um, let's move on to Kit. Um, and you've, uh, you probably have a variety of mini comics. Um, and in your stories, uh, your visual approach um, kind of changes. Yeah, I'm sorry, the sh is, th is the screen down here not working? It's not. Um, I don't know if we can get that back up. Um, so here you've got, you know, using uh, dark with these kind of interjections of light. And in this story, you've got this kind of dreamy color sequence. Um, and then this is the kind of dream story where you're not sure it's a dream story because it has, uh, the character here eventually encounters their cat who's missing and the cat starts talking and it's sort of like, wow, this is just you know, kind of the way it is. Um, and then this is someone who starts sprouting flowers with an understanding that they have a disease that is eventually gonna turn them into a plant. Um, and uh, I'm interested in how, for you, your visual choices inform your story. Um, yeah, I think I do sometimes uh, settle on like a visual metaphor, maybe, before the story takes shape. Um, like Definitely with Weeds, the one with um, the girl who started uh, blossoming <laughs> in the middle of her thesis um, <laughs> <laughs> was um, something that I kind of uh, fixated on as an image and then it kind of took shape as um, like, I, I don't know, something I really related to through um, various experiences in my life. Um, and I think, yeah, just like that image and then what that could um, turn into narratively um, was um, basically, that story wrote itself. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just think the, the various visual metaphors um, are like the, the one with the 50s housewife who's transparent. Um, I think it's just like a pretty obvious um, identity Thing. <laughs> it's not, um, I think that again was another one where it was a simple idea um, that was meant to express something specific um, and it worked well as a mini comic because 
you kind of can't take that visual metaphor much beyond um, beyond that day. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's... Well, and it's interesting because you're telling stories that are like quiet slice of life about particular feelings, um, but you all, the way you do it is always in this style, this kind of fabulous style, introducing fantasy and reality in a seamless way. Um, when you started doing cartooning, is this like just, is this an intuitive approach? Um, I think yeah <laughs> it's very it's very intuitive um i think it's just for like um i find the visual metaphors a really nice way to kind of speak about maybe um emotional truths that um are kind of difficult to get across with just like a really straightforward realistic narrative um and i really like the way that um people can kind of map their own experiences like if they choose not to read the story um, as it is right on the page and want to read into it more, which they don't have to, but um, they might be bringing their own experiences to that story. So, and I think growing up, um, my family communicated 100% in subtext. Like anything that was said wasn't what was actually being said. It was always what was underneath. Um, so I, I really like the way that um, fabulism can kind of be expressing those emotional truths and kind of force you to like read into what is happening because um, that's just how my brain works <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> Thank you, Daryl. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is cool. I, I think that's really cool, too, what you said about your family and the speaking only in subtext and that being a training for comic writing in this manner. Like, I've never thought of that before, but it really, like, sort of trains you to think in this, like... I mean, it's not healthy, but it's <laughs> it trains you to think in this very complicated way, whereas like one thing can mean sh or will mean other things, and like pictures and words sort of divide up the the thought process or something. Yeah, it's a honestly a real bummer to think that way, but that is how I walk through life, like every every day, and that's how I picture my stories, and that's why I love comics so much is yeah cartoonists we're not straightforward yeah <laughs> we, we go things in such an oblique way because like we all have passive aggressive parents <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah oblique is a really really good w way to describe it um you know as you're saying that uh you grow up and you think words have specific meanings and images have specific meanings. It's like if you see something that has, that things should have a hard reality and that what all, all of you are doing is saying, no, that's, that's an illusion. And that no one actually ever does it anyway. And uh, Daryl, um, you were nodding along to a lot of what, uh, of what Kit was saying and uh, it just so happens that you've published a collection of comics that are kind of in this vein, uh, uh, debuting at this show, uh, called Now and Other Dreams. Didn't you publish it? Possibly. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know anything about that. Um, but, uh, and, and when we were, we were putting things together, I was, you know, you kind of pitched like, I mean, you know, you've, you've do a variety of different kinds of co comics, um, and like the other big arm is, um, you know, your Missy comics, so these kind of uh, veiled, veiled memoir. But um, what's interesting is that your your other arm here, which shows these these fabulous comics, which some of which are like obviously very directly dreams. And actually, let me get to you. Actually, I'll come back to Gabby. There you are. Um, <laughs> and. This image is from 
uh, one of my favorite stories called Sub. Um, and uh, sub subconscious uh, underneath, there's, you use a lot of water metaphors in your comics. And they're, all of them also have like, uh, when, when you have these dream images, there's like a slight sense of the absurd. So there's humor comes into your comics like in unex unexpected places. Um, uh, do, these are some of your earliest comics and your first kind of mature ones. Uh, and it was very early in your career. Is this something that you like, how were you thinking visually? Is, was, it, was it much like, Kid, was this like an intuitive decision of like, I'm exploring these ideas and um, this like kind of breach between reality and fantasy? Um, so for, for that particular story, Sub, well, I'll just say that um, Now in Other Dreams is a collection of 10 years of comics that are kind of in this vein. So it's yeah. like mini comics that I was putting out um, that were really small run, and then uh, Rob was kind enough to offer to collect them into a book. Um, and there's, I, w I, rem I was very surprised by how much of a through line there was through all of them, even though they weren't meant to. I didn't intend for them to be collected. Um, and with Sub, uh, that was the first comic where I felt like, oh, this is my voice. Like, I, I don't feel like I'm imitating anyone. Um, and so I guess it was intuitive. Um, but it was like a lot of, there was a lot of failed attempts to make that comic first. Um, uh. Cause it was loosely based off of a lucid dream that I had. Um, it was like a dream where you, yeah, anyone have a, have a lucid dream where you like wake up um, in your dream, but you're still dreaming. Um, and you, everything felt very physical still, even though I was dreaming. And I was like, whoa, my brain can do that. That's cool. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I tried to make it into a comic many times and I couldn't get it right until um, I was living in my mom's house after college and working at this awful coffee shop and w came home from work and just drew this like random 12 page comic about how depressed I was. Um, just like pure reality, like nothing interesting happening for the first 12 pages of this comic of just like saying hi to my mom, being ignored and going up to my room with, that was messy. Um, and then sitting down at my drawing table. And then once I got to my drawing table in the comic, I. I like entered the comic within the comic, it's kind of meta, and that's, it gave me the permission to use my imagination. And then I ended up um, turning, finally making that lucid dream into a comic, and that's there. Um, so I think I needed to like start with reality to like eventually like get bored enough of it to access that dream space in comics and loosen up. I even like, I started with a six panel grid and then by the end it was like this, it was just kind of like wherever on the page. And it's interesting that like you started with standard formal constraints and a lot of your other comics, that's even more the case. Um, do you find that like working in this fabulous style like gives you permission to do whatever you want? Working with what? Wor working in, like a, in this kind of fabulous style, like working in this um, uh, dream imagery, mm -hmm. um, the veil between reality and fantasy that like there's whatever rules there may have been, they're gone. I create my own rules in it. You know, it's like, uh, it's how I've developed my own personal symbolism. Uh, and and it's like, oh, it's become a, a form of reality for me. It's not like, I don't think there's much of a difference now between reality and dream world because I'm always seeing things through my own perspective anyway. And everything's kind of trippy. <laughs> like, like this whole situation right now is pretty weird. Um, <laughs> like, so, um, yeah, I, 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 but I feel like condensing it into comics um, helps me make sense of my experience and in a way that's pleasing to me. Uh, yeah. Awesome. That's <laughs> cool. <laughs> Thanks, Gabrielle. Well, that's kind of interesting because you're saying that it's not just it's not just storytelling, but it's like you're creating your own. Your art is bending reality to your will. It almost sounds like you're saying like. I don't have that much control. <laughs> I wish I did. Right now. But you know, in, but in a sense, it's like the way you're, you're, you're talking about the way the perceptions. But like the art you're making in filtering, so I said this like this makes me this makes me happy. It's not just uh, you know, it's it, in a sense you're like this isn't the way reality 
looks in the real world, but here on the page, um, it's it's going exactly the way I really see it. Is that something that you experience? Um, the, it's I never know what a page is going to end up looking like. So it, it's like I'm, I I think the most pleasing part of it is the surprise element of like um, like having like like maybe like a seed or two of an idea of what will be on there enough to like get started because I get kind of freaked out by a blank page, um, but then having enough openness that. I'll su my subconscious will come through and surprise me um, and reveal something that's like where it's less about like getting it exactly how I want and more about like, oh, cool, that was in there all along or whatever. Um, I love in your comics the relationship between you, your current self, and you at various other ages. Um, like you're having a conversation with yourself. And this is a great example of... Um, you're there, your younger self is there, and you're watching them, and you both have the same, like, imaginative fantasy about having wings. Um, do you find, like, do you find, like, this is a way of, are you trying to, like, kind of um, like, communicate with yourself at various times through the page? I'm, I don't know if this is, like, normal or not, but I, I'm, like, always talking to myself. Mm-hmm. Because I keep, I've been keeping a diary since I was eight, eight years old, and I write in it every day. Um, and sometimes I'll like look back on it and um, and it gives me more empathy for myself because I'm generally pretty self-critical. Um, and when I look back on my diary entries, I'm like, oh, I'm not a bad person, <laughs> you know? Um, and and it's like, I feel like have, like drawing myself as a child, like, is, like especially gives me empathy for myself. And I think that's like the same with like anyone. If I imagine them as, even if like I meet like a total asshole, if I imagine them as a kid, I'm like, oh, you were a kid once. <laughs> um, did I answer your question? <laughs> you did. And actually, that leads me to ask both um, Kit and Rumi in particular. It's like your, your stories are filled with children. Like, uh, they, they tend to dominate your stories, Ch and, and sometimes teens, but mostly kids. Uh, is this like sort of an, is this a, a similar kind of dialogue? Um, why, why, what about is it about children in these settings that seems to make sense for you as storytellers? And you can start, Rumi, if you like. Uh, kids are fun to draw, uh, but also um, I, I still feel, uh, I'm not sure still feeling like a kid is the right way to say this, but I feel like it, I'm the same person. Um, like each kid is a person and it's, it's really interesting because they, they already are in a smaller more energetic package, um, I feel like. Um, so, so yeah, and it it, um, it allows me to revisit my memory and emotions that I had that I probably am still processing, but I'm not actively thinking about it mm -hmm. right now. So, and it just kind of yeah. comes out on the page, kind of yeah, as a result. Yeah. How about for you, Kit? I was trying to think of my stories that are dominated by children and young people. Um, and, okay, so definitely the, um, the basement, okay, so the basement <laughs> is yeah, one basement. that for sure has a kid. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think, like, that specifically was, like, I definitely remembered the experience of being a kid and experiencing um, loss and it being very, very confusing um, and being like just really open to um, comfort and just like really wanting something to make sense of it. Um, so I also just think like kids are amazing because they're so open um, to whatever like fabulous thing happens uh, in their lives. Like they don't really have their um, reality totally um, set up yet. Um, so I guess a, in the narrative, it's easier for them to just kind of accept what's happening. They also have a great excuse as, as kids, they can do crazy things and th people are like, oh, they're just kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they have the best excuse to do whatever. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I just think also, I don't know. I just, I really like kids and young people. And then I think I also have a comic where I'm kind of, in some ways like talking to my younger self. And I just think childhood is a source of so much um, 
anxiety and like to be honest anxiety is like the the fuel of my comics um 100 <laughs> percent uh so it's just it's a really deep well to tap um and <laughs> and um yeah it's just it's a really close time to me i, I don't know it's it, it feels right there all right let us go turn to gabrielle and I, I remember one of the first stories I ever read of yours was in the anthology um, Bogus Dead. And we don't have that here. And you wrote essentially like a very Gabrielle Bell story even then. You were in a bar and then hanging out with people and then zombies attacked. And then like you're like trying to like whack them with copies of McSweeney's. <laughs> and I feel like... Um, this is that was almost like a template for a lot of the things you've done in some of these other stories, um, where you draw them in exactly the same way you draw everything else. There's n there's no difference in the the quality of line or style. Um, it's just that in certain stories, and you draw a lot of completely straightforward memoir, um, which strange things happened, but not you know. It, it, it's rare that someone actually flies in them. Uh, and, um, and then right next to it, you'll have these stories where you're still the character and then all these strange things start happening, like here. Um, or here where you're captured by a giant and living in a cage. Or perhaps your most famous example, Cecil and Jordan in New York, uh, one of my very favorites. Um, uh, a, med a, a meditation on um, being ignored and loneliness. So she's like, no one needs me, so I'm just gonna be a chair now. Um, and then this astoundingly clever and funny visual metaphor. Um, so from the very beginning, this is something that like, this kind of differentiation or lack of differentiation between reality and fantasy was there. Uh, how, what, for you, is it also an intuitive process? You know, in certain other stories, it gets a little wackier, like here with um, Red Riding Hood, you know, which still has a lot of, you mix this, like, you know, naturalistic story with, like, you know, the wolf is eating people. Um, what, a, what was your starting point for all, for these things? And what, is, and what makes you decide between doing a story like this and just doing memoir? Well, I think Daryl said something very interesting about boring yourself. <laughs> like, you just do it until you feel this feeling, like you're like, I don't know, you're just sick of your own voice and you want to go in another direction. I think that, and that, I think that feeling is valuable. I have, like, I think, um, and also something that Daryl said. <laughs> I think I learned it from you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> the snake eats its own tail. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, I got pretty excited when you mentioned lucid dreaming because that other panel is also a lucid dream. This one? Uh, no, the one, no, the flying. That one. I had a couple lucid dreams, and but... They're sort of accidental lucid dreams where, you, where you you just like realize it, and but you're I don't know if you like I I, I want I just want to talk about lucid dreaming. It's so fascinating. Did you have a moment where you realized? That you were yes, dreaming? there's a moment, and it's just like whoa, cool, this is amazing, and but then at the same time you're not or I wasn't as lucid as I am now. Like I was like more kind of. Well, I guess it was lucid in the way that, like, when I'm at SPX, for example, and there's so much overstimulation, I can't really finish a thought, but I'm still conscious. <laughs> so I was like, um, well, I could try flying. Like, it's like the most obvious thing. So, right. So, um, Did you succeed in flying? Yeah, there I am oh. flying. <laughs> and, and this guy is not happy to see you in the story. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I don't, I did something. <laughs> but um, 
I didn't. I, I'm curious, actually, if Daryl, if Daryl, if you learned how to like do it at will. Yeah. 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 I've, yeah, I've, re I've been reading about lucid dreaming. After I had the sort of accidental wake up, I started reading, and apparently you can train yourself to do it. But like, you have there's like beginner's luck where you'll have a few lucid dreams and then, then you have to like rigorously write down and like do all these exercises, which are rather boring. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you have to have like a really traumatic evening and then try to sleep and then you're more likely to have a lucid dream. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's what happened to me. <laughs> what <laughs> happened? <laughs> I did, don't try this at home, kids. Interesting. Um, I have a question for you. Because mm. you did July Diary like based on your real life. Mm -hmm. And then you, now you're doing July Diary as dreams. Yes. So, wait, which is more interesting? Uh, uh, I don't know, but yeah. So I usually used to do, uh, I do a, like a comic every day for a month based on my life. So I thought I would try and do a comic every day for a month based on my dreams. And it was actually my way to try to train myself to lucid dream, but it didn't really work. <laughs> Partly, I think, because my subconscious got very self-conscious. <laughs> like, uh, I was putting so much pressure on my subconscious, and it was the same way I put pressure on my conscious life. I, I was just like, okay, now I gotta do something and make something interesting out of it. And like, it was the same kind of balking. And, and so like, I was having like pretty boring dreams. <laughs> and it's like trying to make something of it. It's hard to say because dreams, doing dreams comics on their own, like as a straightforward dream comic, can be uh, uninteresting to anyone except for the dreamer. But I wanted, I was like, I, I gotta try this, like see it. So I, don't, I really don't know if it worked, except I burned myself out on it. Like it was too much to do one every single day. I thought they were hilarious, like a lot of them were hilarious. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think they worked. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, I guess the consensus is they they work. How much um, narrative or structure did you find yourself putting on them, like when you were doing them, as opposed to when you? Um, well, I tried to do the same thing that I would do as like a diary comic, in which I would try to make some meaning in it, like you know, turn it into a, like a four or six eight panel structure where they turn it into a story but using the elements of life or the dream. So like trying to take meaning from it. Like, so it's not, sometimes I would bend the, the truth, you know, lie a little bit, make mm -hmm. it up to make it more interesting. But um, I really think that taking liberties with the truth is, pretty important for telling a story like <coughs> making you know like what feels true is more important than what is true and, and when I was having the dreams like you know with dreams you can't really say exactly what happened like was like was that your friend that you were talking to or was that your mom or was that you or like but like so then when you're interpreting it you can just decide if it was your mom or like whatever works for the story so it's very it's a really good um subject to work with in, in relation to that my favorite story like this it's grounded in reality that then goes into like ridiculous places is uh the story you did about adapting the scum manifesto oh yeah <laughs> um and it starts off in this very straightforward place, and then suddenly, like, you enter this universe where, like, um, cartoonists are extremely famous and are just <laughs> subject to, like, uh, things like TMZ, and everybody's talking about you doing this, and uh, and it winds up really being a story about, like, you and your mother, and, like, the way you were raised, yeah. and, like, you're giving this, like, award speech, and it's really, you know, it's like you're giving an extended thank you to her. Um, uh, and even like at the end, you're like, none of this really happened. 
it's like the story. The, the story is really boring. I was supposed to, to, you know, someone said I was going to do this, but then, but uh, is that sort of like the symptom of like, you know, I don't want to do this. This seems boring. I want to make make up as much as p stuff as possible to make people laugh. In that case, I will echo Kit's statement about anxiety being a big drive. Mm. <laughs> um, I have to admit that. As, you know, have you guys, has anyone seen the movie Adaptation? I kind of ripped that off. Yeah. <laughs> like if you think about it, Nicolas Cage, he's got to write a movie based on Susan Orlean's book, which is sort of unadaptable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like it's a very like in like the book is just you can't really make it because it, it's in so interior. So I did <laughs> the exact same thing with the. Scum, scum manifestation. I sort of really ripped that off there. <laughs> like, um, so then Nick Cage, he turns it into like a exciting uh, a crime like, thriller. Crime thriller. But then ultimately, it becomes a story between him and his imaginary brother. Right. And so, it, and it's like about I kind of took that structure, and it was the same thing. Nick Cage had to. <laughs> you know, he signs a contract to um, to make a movie based on the orchid thief, and he's like, "Yeah, okay, I'll do it." And then he's like, "Oh shit, the deadline's coming!" <laughs> and so he makes it very meta. And I was the same thing as that. Um, I was asked to do a comic on feminism, <laughs> and I was like, "Yeah, sure, yeah, whatever, I'll do that." They wanted to invite me to Stockholm for the comics festival in Stockholm. And I did that comic just so I could go to Stockholm. Because <laughs> I wanted to go to Sweden. <laughs> so that was this carrot. I was like, I got to do a stupid feminist comic so I can get a trip to Stockholm, Sweden. <laughs> and I was really stuck. <laughs> and then I thought, I don't know, like I think I must have seen Adaptation. And I was like, yeah, that's how I feel. And, and I just kind of. I mean, but the the thing about it is that this, despite like the absurdity and despite the fact you have the structure, the end of that story is a incredibly touching, and then b, you know, you're kind of you kind of dance around it, but at the end you're like, it really is like a powerful feminist story because you the, the thing I it's kind of burned my memories. You're like, you know, my mother didn't raise me to be a girl or a woman. She just kind of raised me to be this thing. And for that, I am grateful. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, it's the way you like the way you stuck the landing on that mm -hmm. in a way that was this like was nonsense for the rest of the story in like a very funny way, and get to the point you know, the and not only that, but you tie it into the actual book you're talking about somehow at the same time. Mm -hmm. Did you did you when you landed at that point? Did you uh, was that just like an intuitive process? Or were you like aiming at that the whole time? I think it was intuitive. I mean, I think at the same time, I was kind of realizing the benefits of benign neglect, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, it's kind of, I think, I mean, now uh, looking back on it, it's like, it's very <laughs> representative of the, like the third wave feminism idea of like a woman could do anything as well as any man and like uh, it doesn't really address like feminine emotions and like maybe females and women and it's a spectrum and men and like like um basically I'm I mean I was in like <laughs> I think maybe if I did it differently, I, it would be more nuanced. And I don't know, it's, just, it's the same thing. But uh, yeah, it was like the idea that she. I think there's this. Okay, the, like the song, The Boy Named Sue. <laughs> right. It's a bo um, about a guy, his dad named him Sue and then left him. <laughs> and so then he ended up, he spent his life fighting people because they made fun of him for his name, and then he was ultimately grateful to his dad for naming him Sue, because it made him tough. <laughs> My mom's name is Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with Sue. <laughs> She's tough. Is she tough? Okay. But the whole, you know, the whole model is, is like, 
being raised like a boy and like being able to cope in a man's world. Right. But um, I'm still grateful for my mom, you know, to do that. Um, you know, you, you mentioned anxiety about that story, and it's kind of funny because this image, you're like, I must have done something wrong. You know, that's kind of anxious. The giant story is anxious. Do you find like anxiety being fuel for yourself in general? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think we probably all have a strange relationship with anxiety because you don't want to be true. Like, it's like the devil is like poking at you with a pitchfork, and you're like, that's how you create this stuff that is beautiful and like. You don't want it. To, like you want to be motivated by good feelings, but yeah. <laughs> how about for everyone else? Like, what a. How is your approach um, with this? What emotions fuel it? You know, apart from anxiety. Like, what emotions do we feel that motivate us to work? Yeah. Hmm. Sometimes revenge. <laughs> Like, like, like wanting to yeah. get revenge, like I'll show you, but but then it turns into like something a little bit wiser. Like, as yeah, like, yeah, because actually, like getting like using comics to get revenge on somebody, ultimately doesn't feel very good, but it is a motivation at the same time. Yeah, I, I feel like um, it's less of an. I I don't think it's as much of an emotion as like. Uh, habit at this point, like a, like I need to meditate every day, I need to like create something. It's like clears out the system. Mm. Mm. It's, a, it's like self-care. <laughs> um, and then I feel better afterwards, um, more like myself. Speaking of motivation though, I wonder if you guys like, rec like sometimes you just feel this joyful sense of creativity. Like I just feel like I gotta express something. I'm like <laughs> Like, not anxiety, but joy and love and, like, the yeah. desire to just create something beautiful. It seems, like, when I feel that way, comics are this is so awkward and, <laughs> and just, like, time-consuming, and that feeling is long gone by the time you finish the page. I, I love inking, but I hate everything... That displaced the forehead. Um, so it's like painful, 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 <laughs> and joy. That's it. Um, but I, uh, some people love thumbnails, and mm. I, don't, I don't know why. I don't know how their brain is. Psychos. Yeah. <laughs> so, so <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, like, love is a really big, it, it sounds really fake, but it's true. Like, love is a really big motivator. And, um, like, being kind, talking to my anxiety, talking to other people who feel the way that I do or have felt the way that I've felt. Um, and just, yeah, the, the opportunity to um, be nice to myself and other people is, is really, really important. Just, like, an act of empathy is, is huge for me. Uh, we have time for some questions, if anyone has any. We have a mic over here. Yeah. Uh, I'll just say one more thing while we're waiting. Yeah, um, go. I feel like when I feel like that desire to like, like joy to make something, I don't usually dra gravitate towards comics. I usually want to do karaoke um, <laughs> or, or write a song. Yeah, because I do agree, like, music is, like, the most, like, direct expression of that feeling. I like to dance for that reason, mm -hmm. too. And or it's also just, like, drawing, like, just free drawing. So, so. Yeah. Writing, storytelling is very intellectual. And, and, yeah, painful. Like, I totally agree with Rumi. It's, like, it's awful a lot of the time, making comments. <laughs> yeah. Please. Um, I just want to know the question everyone asks, which is like, what's, uh, what's the thing you're working on and not done, or is there anything you're not working on? Um. <laughs> 
Gabby, why don't you start? <laughs> I guess I'm still working at the dream comics. I, like, I, like I said, I just did it. I did it for a month, and it was like too rigorous. And my subconscious was like, "Come on, let me breathe a little." <laughs> so I think I'm gonna try to slow it down and maybe do it every week or something like that. But I kind of in between, in between projects. And Uh, Daryl? She is immortal, so. <laughs> Um, I just finished uh, making a comic for the Short Box Digital Fair that's coming out in October. And if you like comics about anxiety that have fabulism, <laughs> that's what that is. Um, Stay and, on brand. <laughs> yeah, and so then I, I just really like making short comics. I'm trying to get some pitches together, but um, I'm just gonna keep making mini comics for a while, I think. Also, uh, I just published one of oh, these yeah. comics at the Parcel Press table. <laughs> you should. Thanks, Dara. <laughs> um, I'm two, two big projects that I want to work on. Um, I'm writing a graphic novel for kids that's going really slow, but it's going to be about um, uh, a monster who loves bonsai. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but he's a little bad because he's trying to kidnap kids to make into <laughs> <laughs> Extra cool. Um, and the, the other one it's going to be for all ages or adults only. I'm not, but it's too early to tell what it's about. I'm not really sure what it's about yet, but I, I, I have some characters and uh, I want to figure it out. Wonderful. Anyone else? Please, go ahead. Hey, um, so this question kind of came out after um, Gabrielle said, um, you were talking about like, like a devil poking a stick at you as like a motivation. And so kind of, sorry, I'm struggling to articulate this question, but to put things into context, like I felt like the most like creative like inspiration when I was like at my like mental low. And so like lately I've been like, um, you know, mental health has been like getting better, been feeling good, but the um, creative inspiration has been kind of waning, I guess, because using art as like a coping mechanism has been kind of waning as well. So I'm like, oh, should I put myself in like adverse situations again? At the same time, that's like, that's not a good idea, right? It's not healthy. So like, I guess if, if you're trying to get, if, if you understand what I'm trying to get at, like, how do you like, what, what's your, what's your experience has been trying to like, deal with that like or deal with that conflict it's not really a balance or maybe it is if, if that makes sense like I mean the adverse situations are just always gonna come we can't stop that we live in a world full of adverse yeah but what if you're what if you're really good at avoiding them <laughs> you can't 
They will catch yeah. up with you, and you should not put yourself in them because they're there for you. <laughs> Fair. Um, no, I, I don't know. I don't think it's sustainable to suffer. I mean, as speaking as somebody older, it catches up with you. All the, all, all the neurosis. And you, you all, you have to face and deal with all of it. So I would say, don't add any. No. But uh, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't think that it's true that your best work will necessarily come out of your lowest no. points. Like. Probably don't even know your highest points yet. Yeah, and that's yeah. kind of what I've been hedging on, you know? It's like, let me experience the highs, you know, see what comes out of that, so. Yeah, keep them a try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think, like, the best point is, like, when you can look from a place of reflection, like, yeah. and at back at those really wild times in your life. Um, like, I don't think being in it, it gives you a great viewpoint. Um, to write about and but later on I just I don't know humans have so much to cope with and there's so much material there um, and but I think that it's it's really like you need to be in a place to look back and be like what was that about and to yeah. explore um, explore from that perspective um, I think that's when it gets really interesting it reminds me of when um, James O'Barr when he made The Crow he said after he finished making it it made him feel worse like <laughs> After what happened, so. And it's like not sustainable to like yeah. kind of like work that way, but like just like from that lower place. Um, I've tried it, um, but I'm not tried it, but like I've been there. Um, and I, I think that like developing a sustainable practice is especially like you need like it's like the most one of the most important things you can do as a cartoonist because it's it's like if you're in it for the long haul because it's otherwise it's like there's not much reward to the work. Like you need to create your own feeling of like reward from like the actual making of the thing. Um, and that's like something that I've been learning slowly. Um, it takes time uh, and you get bored, um, you feel bored yourself, but like you work through that. And I, I feel like you'll encounter problems in the work too that like you want to solve. And that's better than encountering problems in your life, I think. Um, it's more manageable. Yeah. Uh, and you'll be, and there'll still be like things that are personal to you. All right. Well, that is all the time we have for the panel. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for a fantastic. <laughs>